Welcome to our May Facebook Live. Hope you're enjoying the weather. We have a very special guest tonight, <coughs> Dr. Bob Oates, um, who's a professor of urology at Boston University and a male infertility specialist. Um, he is a leader in the field, both here in Boston and nationally, so we're very honored to have Dr. Oates with us tonight. We're going to be talking about, obviously, male factor infertility, um, how to identify problems, why they happen, and what you can do with um, a specific diagnosis. So as usual, if you have any questions, you can send us a message or leave them right there in the comments, and we'll be happy to answer them. So to get started, Dr. Steyer, Dr. Oates, and Dr. Zyman. Thank you, Arsene. Thank you very much. Hello. <laughs> Thank you Hi Bob everyone. for being here. Sure. Happy Such to a be pleasure here. and a privilege to have you here. Great, great. It should be fun. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I'm starting? Yeah. Okay, great. So, Bob, it's such a pleasure to have you here, and we want to just start with simple things. In terms of <laughs> in terms of infertility in men, what's your approach? How do you decide where you know who to come in and who to have see you and what to do i think um you know all couples deserve uh, at least evaluation of both partners certainly that's for sure i think if a couple starts out with a reproductive endocrinologist and the semen analysis is normal then there's really little reason for the man to be sent to me but i think if there's any abnormalities in the semen analysis or any abnormalities in the history that would be a good time to come and see me so you could have a normal semen analysis but the Reproductive endocrinologist gets a sense that maybe there's some sexual dysfunction going on. So that would be an excellent mm -hmm. reason to come and see me. Um, otherwise, we just do it based on the semen analysis parameters and whether they're low. That generates a visit to the urologist, the male fertility specialist. And, and what about a semen analysis? What's, what are you looking at when you're doing well, a Well, I mean, analysis? once you produce an analysis, then it takes a little bit, but not a long, long time, but a little bit um, to analyze it. And what we're looking for is we're looking for the amount of fluid, that's the volume, sperm count, that's how many sperm would be swimming around, then the percentage of sperm that are swimming around, and then finally, sort of how well they are swimming. So are they swimming just slowly, or are they swimming really, really fast? And then there's one other parameter that we look at, which is the shape of the sperm, which we pay a lot of attention to, and in some cases, it's everything. In most cases, eh, it doesn't mean that much, but it's still really important to look at for every single case. So that's sort of the basic semen analysis. Mm -hmm. We usually have one, oftentimes we'll go ahead with a second one, but it really just depends upon what the first one shows and what the history is of the man. So do we need a second one? It's always a question that we ask once we have the first one. And what if the first one is low? Is it time to panic? It is never time to panic. It is never time to panic because, one, we have great reproductive <laughs> endocrinologists who are going to help you get pregnant anyway. Yes, yes, always. 100% pregnant. Always, always. Um, but the most important thing is that the sperm count is not that predictive of pregnancy mm -hmm. achievement in and of itself. So what we do is we look at everything. So I'm working with the reproductive endocrinologist. They're looking at the female. I'm looking at the male. We put all of that together. So there's no single thing which is going to tell us this is a disaster, this is a situation that's not going to work. We look at all of these data points and put them all together because our treatments and our strategies are going to depend upon both partners, not just one or the other. Great. And when you're doing analysis, people wonder, okay, the semen analysis is abnormal. How do you know? Is it a production problem? Is yep. it a plumbing problem? How do you sort that out? Well, I mean, a lot of times it's, it doesn't come from the semen analysis. Sometimes it does because you can look at certain parameters like the volume. So that's the amount of fluid that's coming out. That might tell me something, especially if there's no sperm. But the diagnosis most often comes from the history and also the physical exam. So see, physical exam... You can't get that from the semen analysis. You have to feel the testicles, feel the size of the testicles, feel the structures that drain the sperm from the testicles, and feel it for other things called varicoceles and hydroceles and other sort of assorted problems. But the physical is the key and critical element to making the diagnosis for the male. All right, and what, um, what can a man do? His sperm counts low. Can he take vitamins, supplements? That's a great question because you can go online and once this program's over, don't, don't go <laughs> online right now. Once this program's over, then you can feel free to go online. And what you'll see is you'll see all these ads for supplements and minerals and vitamins and products like that. 
as long as you have a good healthy diet then your body's going to try to generate the most sperm it has the genetic capacity to generate so healthy diet healthy living meaning sleep good night's sleep and a good diet and exercise those are three components to good health great 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 awesome. yeah. So when we see patients in the office, we're always, this is one of the major tests we look at to see the analysis. And always here, we think about what they're gonna be treating, where they do IVF, where we retrieve eggs from the ovaries, combine sperm and egg in addition, transfer an embryo, versus doing IUI intrauterine insemination, where we actually put sperm into the uterus. Now, when you're looking at someone, looking at the parameters, are there certain things that you see that you think are more um, appropriate to go to IUI versus IVF when you're seeing someone in the office? Well, I mean, whenever I see a patient to start with, my thought process always begins with, can I help this couple to achieve a pregnancy mm -hmm. naturally? Mm -hmm. So do we have methods and ways that we can improve the male to the point where it becomes likely they'll become pregnant naturally? Mm -hmm. That's always a good starting point for yeah. me at least. When we talk about IVF and ICSI and IUI, the difference between those two, we know that we need to have a certain number of sperm to make IUI mm -hmm. successful, mm -hmm. but it also depends upon the couple. So if the couple has had intercourse for 12 years mm -hmm. and he has a fairly decent count and a fairly decent motility then IUI is probably not going to be that beneficial mm -hmm. for them. There's something else going on which is much more deep, much mm -hmm. more severe. Mm -hmm. Certainly when the sperm count is incredibly low, IUI will not be successful. When we take sperm surgically harvested sperm, so we might take sperm from the testicle, we might take sperm from the gland outside the testicle mm -hmm. called the epididymis, surgical surgically retrieved sperm always has to be used with ICSI mm -hmm. because it doesn't have the capacity to fertilize or swim on its own once you put it into an egg then it works mm -hmm. perfectly so certain sperm types you need to use ICSI other ones you have a choice okay, great great we have several patients to come for their with their second marriage or second relationships they've had children before they've had vasectomies and many of them want to try naturally without having to do go to mm -hmm. IVF with extracted sperm and so they always ask what are the success rates after reversal of vasectomies can you comment on really what you're in your experience with the success rate as a return of normal sperm what are the factors predicting mm -hmm. return of normal sperm and also fertility afterwards if you have return of normal sperm right so it's a it's a wonderful question because there are three options that couples always mm -hmm. have and the first one is to use just aspirated sperm mm -hmm. and as I pr present to the couple there always seems like that's a great idea mm -hmm. because for the guy he's sitting there thinking to himself well I don't need to have an operation this is just great you yeah. can just stick a needle in you can just get some sperm this is wonderful mm -hmm. until I say but then how do you use the sperm okay you have to use it with ICSI as mm -hmm. I was just saying a few minutes ago so for the couple it, th that approach does not lessen the cost or the morbidity. So one partner or the other is going to have something done which is intensive. Mm -hmm. You can have a reversal, so just a reconstruction, or there's a third possibility which is at the time of a reconstruction we can take some sperm mm -hmm. and freeze it just in case the reconstruction doesn't work. But reconstruction is really very successful. It depends upon the time out from the vasectomy. Now there is a myth that is out there. It persists out there which is 10 years it's a magical number of 10 years that before 10 years you'll have great success and after your vasectomy is 10 years old you'll have terrible success that is not true it just generally kind of slides down as the mm. years go by so for those of us who do it at a high level and that's a very important thing mm -hmm. you always want to find someone who this is a major part of their practice they've done training in uh, microsurgery because mm -hmm. it's all done under the operating microscope and it really is something that they concentrate on. So for those of us who do it at a high level, if your vasectomy was less than three years, it's almost 99% across the board. You're gonna have sperm return mm -hmm. to the ejaculate. Sort of three to eight years, comes down a little bit, maybe 95%, 10 years, 92%. Even when you get out to 15 or 20 years, the success rate of return of sperm to the ejaculate is about, 20, is about 85%. So it's still a really good return of sperm but pregnancy is different because pregnancy involves the other partner mm -hmm. so certainly if the partner is 22 that is much much better than if the partner is 38 so mm -hmm. that's always a part of the conversation mm -hmm. the decision is always the couple's decision and so for example if it's a couple who's already had three children they had a vasectomy they'd like to have a fourth oftentimes they're not interested in in vitro fertilization or mm -hmm. ICSI or anything like that but what if the couple's different and it's a new relationship and the woman has blocked fallopian tubes? Well, see, she deems in vitro fertilization 
anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. So why would we do a reversal? That's a perfect option mm -hmm. for right. just an aspiration. So the decision that the couple makes involves not only him, but her. And then there's even a, a more unusual circumstance where perhaps she has a mutation in a gene that causes breast cancer, for example. She may not want to pass that mutation along to offspring. Well, you don't have that choice if you're having natural reproduction. But through in vitro and ICSI, mm -hmm. we can actually select embryos mm -hmm. that will not carry that mutation. So there, again, good example where aspiration for the male is really the right choice. Great, great. Now, as, as everyone can, can see, there's a great uh, interplay of different teams here, the uh, fertility team as well as reproductive urology team. Can you comment, Bob, on what you see in your career as being the best kind of arrangement and teamwork amongst the two different groups? Well, communication is always mm -hmm. the key. That is absolutely the first and foremost thing. So when I see a patient, I have all these different mechanisms of getting my notes right to the reproductive endocrinologist because oftentimes the visit for the couple with the reproductive endocrinologist, Allison or Aaron, might be the next day, might mm -hmm. be two days later. So it really can't be, well, I'll dictate a letter, I'll put it in the mail three days from now, it'll get to the reproductive endocrinologist in two weeks. It really has to be good communication. They need to know what I'm thinking and I need to know what they're thinking because it's not me that's making the decision. Mm -hmm. It's not them that's making the decision. It's the couple. It's all four of us. So the more information I have, the more information I can provide to them, the better educated the couple is, which means the better decisions that they make for themselves mm -hmm. with our guidance and our help. One of the other question that was raised um, partially before is how does supplements or dietary um, factors impact semen parameters? A common question I get is how does smoking, whether it be tobacco or marijuana, affect semen analyses, um, results, and semen parameters? Can you comment on the, on the impact of those two things? Yeah, smoking and marijuana. Smoking first might decrease natural fertility a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's a slight bit controversial. It might decrease sperm counts, might decrease sperm motility a little bit. Little on the controversial side. We know, however, when a couple goes to in vitro fertilization, and if the male is smoking, that will decrease the success rates. But that's not actually what I focus on mm -hmm. in terms of male smoking. We know that the children of men who were smoking at the time of conception have higher chances of getting certain cancers mm -hmm. as little kids. So I'm not as interested in the fertility aspects. I'm more interested in the health of the offspring. Because mm -hmm. when we talk about fertility with our couples, we've got this understanding that it's not really just about getting them pregnant. Mm -hmm. The real goal is not pregnancy, the real goal is having a healthy mm -hmm. child. And so yep. this okay. conversation mm -hmm. brings the health of the child into, or right up to the front of it. Marijuana, we don't know as much about that, uh, but we're cautioning our couples because it certainly might be, we might find out in five years or 10 years that it was detrimental. So mm -hmm. I think at this point in time where we don't know, and it's not something that's required, it's a choice that the, the man is making, that we ask him to stop. Mm -hmm. At least slow down, but ideally stop, because then he's eliminating every possible yeah. toxin from his body, which it can mm -hmm. only be a good thing. It cannot be a negative mm -hmm. to have little or few or no toxins in the body. Two other small things, uh, alcohol use as well as obesity. Can you comment on the impact of those yeah. on semen production? <laughs> alcohol use, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. There's no great studies that show that alcohol in normal quantities but it's a health issue. Mm -hmm. So when I see somebody who is drinking 10 or 12 beers a day, and I do have patients who drink that yes, much, yes. then I'm not so concerned about their fertility. I'm mm -hmm. in doctor mode at mm -hmm. that point, mm -hmm. and I'm really just getting back to my doctoring. That's a lot of alcohol for mm -hmm. an individual. Mm -hmm. So I'll recommend that he really reduces that. Um, obesity is interesting because there are, as a group, a risk of there is a risk of infertility in obese men as a group that doesn't mean the individually obese man mm -hmm. will have reduced semen parameters so reduced sperm count or reduced sperm motility but it's the same thing i get into my doctor mode again and we talk about good health uh, <clears throat> dietary factors that lead to obesity are important and that's been shown clearly in in recent studies so good healthy diet good weight from a good healthy diet and exercise and a good night's sleep. Those are the things that we want to strive for because it is a good moment in a young person who is obese to try to affect their general health in a positive direction, which will be a positive direction for the rest of their life. So I oftentimes take that because again, 
that's what I learned uh, from being a physician. So I'm a physician first, mm -hmm. reproductive urologist second. So I always want to come back to that physician first. Yeah. Great. That's Great. excellent. Thank you so much. So maybe we can do a little recap yeah. of some summary statements, some things that we learned. So, Bob, we learned that male infertility is very common. Correct. We learned that the analysis of sperm is quite mm -hmm. complex. Yes. And that you have to look at all the parameters, including the way the sperm looked, mm -hmm. and not to panic if we Correct. see a low count Do on the first panic. one. Do not panic. Um, we learned that there's lots of treatment options, and it really is important to work with a specialist like yourself to figure out what treatment option is going to be best to you. And there are a lot of options even with vasectomy and vasectomy mm -hmm. reversals. And the best kind of care is a communication, open mm -hmm. care between the reproductive endocrinologist and the urologist. And I would even say most guys, if they're in a, in a couple relationship where there's fertility issues, they should mm -hmm. see someone like Absolutely. Dr. Oates. They really should. Even if you know your partner is there yep. and working with someone like Aaron or me, mm -hmm. it's really important to get the man in there too to get evaluated. Yeah, and remember too, the last thing I would say is that even if you see the man sees a urologist first and the sperm counts very, very low, I mean really low for example, that doesn't mean there are no female issues. Mm -hmm. So it is always important for both partners to be worked up and evaluated mm -hmm. by people who have a specialty, because you can find those. You can mm -hmm. always find those. That's true. That's and great. that we all work together yeah. to keep everyone healthy, because right. yep. a healthy lifestyle is going right. to be a better outlook yeah. for mm -hmm. you for your reproduction. So yeah. that's it. That's well, thank well. you. We feel very fortunate to work with Dr. Oates you do. Um, and have his expertise for all of our patients. So thank you very much for You're joining welcome. us. You're yes. welcome. Thank, thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank